Thank you, Hal. Good to see everyone this morning. I want to thank all those who have been a part of our worship service this morning. Thank you for uh, careful prayer and the men who helped at the table. Uh, we appreciate you very much you assisting us this morning. If you will turn your Bibles to second uh, to First Peter, let's go to First Peter. We're studying Second Peter um, Bible study. But let's go to First Peter chapter five. <coughs> Knowing your enemy. Now, when we used to think about enemies, of course, enemies come at different times and uh, different situations. Um, the, uh, one of the big trade partners, <coughs> pardon me, that we have with uh, our economy is Japan. But at one time, uh, we would have seen them as our adversary or our enemy. But things change. But there is one unique that is always going to be against us, no matter who we are, where we live, what time of history we live, it's not going to matter. And that is Satan. He is our enemy. And the best thing we can do is to arm ourselves of knowledge about him. And over in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 5, Peter says, We know me. subject to your elders. Elders here he's talking about not shepherds or bishops. Rather this is older people. He's saying submit yourselves to them. And to all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another for God is opposed to the proud because grace is humble. <laughs> Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in the proper time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now this morning as we think about Satan, and as Peter is giving this admonition, and he talks about be careful about pride, exalting yourself, because Satan is looking for the prideful person. He is looking for that person that is caught up in their own words. If you notice in these verses that he talks about submission, humility, trusting God, and self-control. And all of these things are vital and important because these are the cracks that Satan is looking for. He is seeking, walking about as a lion. Now this morning as Peter paints a word picture, you can just imagine Satan and that he is like a roaring lion. We live in an area where there are no big predators that roam the hillsides like wolves or bears or lions. But in that day, they understood the name of the wild animal. Today we don't have to worry about that too much. But yet we still understand that Satan is like a predator. A predator. That's what a lion is. He is a predator. And Satan walks about looking for those that will fall prey to him because of the issues that Peter just talked about. Now, as I've said, there are five things that I want us to look at about Satan this morning as we understand our enemy. The first thing is, I want you to know, to understand his person. Understand Satan's person. He is a real person. Years ago, and I know I'm kind of dating myself, and probably a lot of people are not going to admit this, but years ago there was a fellow, a comedian named Flip Wilson. You remember Flip Wilson? So I'm not really willing to say, yeah, I remember him, but this was back a long time ago, boys and girls. And uh, he had a TV show, and uh, he had a little saying that he kind of coined that later you could see on t shirts all over the place. Remember what it was? The devil made me do it. Remember that? And it was kind of a joke that if anything happened, well, the devil made me do it. And we kind of saw Satan as being this unassuming, very uh, calm and uh, something that is not really powerful. It's more of a joke. But let me tell you, Satan is real. He is not a joke. He is not like uh, the red devil or the red devil I can or the Underwood's devil Ham can that's got this person in a red suit and horns and he's got a pitchfork. You know, that, that's not really Satan. But Satan is a real person. We sometimes think of Satan as being, well, that's just the personification of evil. But no, it's more than that. He is real. He is a real person. 
As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 speaks of him as the prince of the power of the air. Uh, Jesus called him a murderer and a liar from the beginning. Paul described him as being cunning. And if you go to Job, you'll find in Job chapter 1 that he was an individual who showed up on the scene to accuse man. And later on, he is called the accuser of the brethren because he accused man before God. Now, if you really want to see Satan in action, see just how much of a person he really is, go with me to Genesis chapter 3 for just a moment. We'll not take the time to read the entire chapter. But I just want you to see here that, that Satan is a real person. Now, Satan is coming in the form of a serpent. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, for the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent says, surely you will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now this is Satan in action. And of course, Eve now is going to see the tree in verse 6. She is going to see that it is appealing to the eye, that it is desirable to make one wise, and that it is a fruit that is delicious to eat. Now you see how Satan is a real person. He is not a fictitious character. He is not the epitome of evil. He is not somebody that is running around in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. But he is a real person. And he is wanting to get at you in any way that he possibly can. And so we've got to know that he is real. The greatest thing that Satan can do is to convince the world that he is not real. That's, uh, that's all he's got to do. Is just convince the world that he is not real. And then number two, you've got to know his position. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Know his position. As the Apostle Paul is writing, he tells us in verse 11, Ephesians 6 and verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now I want you to notice his position here. Look at verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Satan is not flesh and blood, but he is spiritual. Notice that he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. His position is a spiritual position. He is known as the tempter, and that he is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. But he is not an individual, but he is a spiritual person. As a matter of fact, we're told in, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41 that he not only is real, but he also has angels that are with him as well. Do you know that Satan has angels? Over Matthew 25, as Jesus is talking about the judgment day, you know, he's talking of end times. And as he's discussing what is called eschatology, the, the study of end times, he talks about it, Satan and his angels are going to be cast into hellfire. Now notice that he said Satan and his angels. Not just Satan, but and his angels as well. He has a controlling empire or a controlling uh, kingdom. In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14, the Bible after talking about the fact that there were these spirits that were coming that looked like frogs, he says, for this is the one who exercises authority over the nations. And when he says exercises authority over the nations, He's talking about that Satan is running loose upon the world. And he is exercising authority, not politically, but morally. He is exercising authority over the people of the earth. And he controls them. And uh, also notice 
that in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, that Paul describes Satan as being the God of this age. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians and look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. Now notice what he says. I want to begin back in verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, Paul is talking about the, his ministry. He's talking about the gospel. And some people say, well, the gospel, is it really? Is it difficult? Is it not easy to understand? No, he says it is easy. But he says now, if it is veiled, that's what he's talking about, the, how easy it is to understand it. He says it's veiled to those who are perishing. It is veiled to those who do not want to understand it, is what he's saying. And notice now that he says, in whose case the God of this world, the God of this age, he's talking about Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. Now, have you ever gone into a room and wanted, your objective was to look in a mirror, but before you could look in the mirror, you first had to turn the lights on. All right, the Word of God is described in James as like a mirror. You know, you want to see yourself physically, you look in a mirror. That's why you go to the uh, department stores and you try on clothes. You try on clothes in a dressing room. And there's usually one thing that every dressing room has got in common. What is that? It may or may not have a chair. It may or may not have a pin cushion. It may or may not have a rack for you to hang your hanger on. But I can just about guarantee you it's going to have a mirror. And the reason is, is because when you put those clothes on, you want to see what you look like, don't you? You want to see what you look like. Okay, physically we look into a mirror, but when we want to look at ourselves spiritually, we look in the Word of God. And what does the God of this age do? He turns the light off. So that if you look in the mirror, though you can't understand, then what happens? Well, you can't see yourself. And the understanding comes when you want to understand or you don't want to understand it's not something that has got to be done through some special operation of the Holy Spirit or anything. I'm not saying that. But I am saying there are those who don't understand the Bible. It's because they choose not to understand it. And the choice, he says, well, they have been blinded in their minds. They have turned the light off so that they cannot spiritually see themselves. They don't want to see themselves. Sometimes we get in a spirit in our mind that we don't want to see ourselves either. We can read the Bible, but we don't want to apply it to our life. You see, we flip the switch. We cut the light off. But the objective to be more like the image of Christ is you've got to turn the light on so you can see yourself in God's Word, that mirror that, that will show you or reflect your spirit and how well you're doing. And he says the God of this world will cut the light off on you. And uh, that's his position now. He is the God of this world. Satan wants control of you. He wants control of you. And the way he does that is by helping you in your attitude to flip off the light switch so you don't read and study and apply God's Word to your life. And then number three, we've got to know his power. We've got to know his power. You know, the Apostle Paul, in describing his job, if you like, turn with me to Acts the 26th chapter. In Acts 26, Paul is rec recounting the conversation that he had with the Lord. The Lord had never struck him down and wrote to Damascus and later on he became the Apostle Paul. But notice as, as he is talking in uh, chapter 26, he is recounting what happened back in Acts chapter 9. He says, look at verse 17, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. This is God talking now to, to Paul. To open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who have been sanctified by faith in Him. And notice what he said. To turn them from darkness to light. That's the preaching of the gospel. He says, Paul, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to preach this gospel which will turn them from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. See, that's what's 
for God's sake, we got, he's got dominion. You notice that? He's dominion. And so he's got power. He can work power over you if you allow him to do so. And then number four, I want you to notice, now we've noticed this morning that Satan is real. He has a person, he has a position, he has power, but he also has a purpose. His purpose. His purpose. You know that Satan originally had a purpose. And that purpose is found in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. As Isaiah is speaking, he's talking of Israel and how Israel had turned away from God. And now he uses an illustration, and the illustration is Satan. Notice what he says in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise, I will rise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. See, Satan's original uh, uh, thing that he wanted to do was to rise above God. Was to rise above God. God, we, sometimes we ask the question, well, why did God create Satan? Well, he really didn't create Satan. He created a very powerful angel. This angel's name is Lucifer. And this angel was, had more power and more beauty than all the other angels. And God had given the angels the ability to decide whether they wanted to be with him or not. And this angel, Lucifer, had decided that he wanted to take God's throne from him. It was a rebellion. It was like a coup. And so he attempts a coup upon God. And God cast him down. And he says, now what happened to you is because of your thinking that I will arise and be higher than God. And God says, no, that's not going to happen. But that's what the, the purpose of Satan. Satan wants you to worship him and not God. Now today we have uh, satanic worship. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about worshiping and in, inverted pentagons and things like that. Uh, he's not talking about sacrificing and you know, using various days to worship. And that's all. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about, I want you to put me before God. I want you to allow me to tell you what to do rather than you to tell you what to do. You see, it's a more practical thing. There are people who worship Satan, but they're not running around in black clothes with black fingernails and claiming to be witches and, and uh, uh, you, you know, all those sorted things. He's not talking about that. He's talking about this regular old folks that decide they're going to fall into the snares of Satan rather than obeying God. That's what his purpose is. It is to draw us away from God. It is to devour us. A lion goes on the prowl. A lion hunts for the purpose of devouring its prey. And that's the purpose that Satan has. He wants to devour us. Why? Because he wants to strike God. And he knows that he can't get to God, but if he can hurt us, he will hurt God. And so he seeks to hurt us. And then finally, you've got to understand his plan. You've got to know his plan. In Ephesians 6 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of Satan. The wiles, the schemes of Satan. Satan has a scheme. He has a plan to pull you away from God. In 2 Corinthians 2, in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, Be careful that you're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Do you know Satan uses things? He uses attitudes. He uses our hearts. And he says, Don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. And then in 2 Timothy 3, in verse 26, Rather, rather uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 26. He says, be careful of the snares of Satan. Now, the word snare in this instance is talking about a trap. But it is describing a particular part of the trap. 
I don't know if any of you have ever had problems with, say, raccoons or some kind of rodents, you know, and you, you put a trap out and you try to get, get them entrapped. Well, they usually are pretty skilled. Uh, coyotes, raccoons, uh, it takes a lot of work to be able to catch them. Uh, I know whenever, uh, um, several years ago, my brother had some raccoons that uh, kept coming up and uh, turning his trash can over and tearing up the garbage bags and spraying garbage everywhere, so he put some live traps out. And he started out, and he kept catching the neighbor's cat. That poor cat was never could learn. You know, that just because there's a can of cat food in there, you don't go in. But he kept catching the neighbor's cat. But then he got to noticing that the trap would be empty, it would still be set, but the food would be empty, though the can would be empty, and they were going to the other side, reaching through, pulling it over, and eating the food out of it. And so he had to wire the can to the center. And finally, he got where they would go in and they would trigger the mechanism to make the trap spring shut and catch it. We see that's the way Satan works. He has those little mechanisms in everybody's life that where that bait is. He knows what that bait is for you. Your bait may be different from my bait, but he knows what that bait is to trap us, to snare us, to entangle us. And so we've got to know these things. You know, as Peter talks about Satan being like the roar in the lion, a lot of times we don't realize just how ferocious this is. If you go back to Genesis chapter 4, you know the story of, of Cain and Abel. How that Abel offered more excellent sacrifice. Cain became angry about it, and he kills his brother Abel. God is discussing this with Cain, and he says, Cain, why is it that your countenance is fallen? Don't you realize that if you'll offer a good sacrifice, I'll accept it like I except yours. Well, Cain still wasn't happy, and so he rose up one day and he killed his brother Abel. God again comes to Cain and says, where's your brother? Remember Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. And he had told him earlier, he says, now Cain, sin lies at the door. The word lie there is a word that meant an animal that is crouching to pounce upon its prey. That's the Hebrew word that's being used here. And he's saying, Satan is in a crouching position, just waiting for you to crack the door of your heart because of your hate or your resentment or your anger, just a little bit. And when you do, in he's going to go. And sure enough, his resentment, his anger, his bitterness, it turned to murder. It turned to murder. You see how cunning, how divisive, how powerful Satan can be in an individual's life. And the key is to know that these things are out there. Know your enemy, Satan. He goes on to say now, he's like a roaring lion seeking him that he may devour. But he says, overcome him, overcome him through your faith. Today, your faith is stronger. He is of the world, but there's one thing that is greater than that one of the world. You know what it is? Even our faith. Our faith is greater. This morning, if you exercise your faith, you have repented of your sins, confess Christ, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Let me encourage you to do that. I'll be able to stand